So I'm going to go off script for a second. Um, yesterday, Pastor Costin, this is kind of when you know that <clears throat> what, you need, what you're wanting to talk about or what you're being led to talk about, the Holy Spirit's involved. So Pastor Costin, uh, he and Clarice went out of town this weekend, but he texted me. We were kind of going back and forth and, you know, normal stuff, you know, good luck. Um, I'll be praying for you. Holy Spirit's, you know, got your back, all those normal things, and telling them, be careful on your trip, you know, hope you, everything goes safe. But he asked, what are you speaking about? And I said, um, spiritual warfare. And his response, I had to share. It just said, oh, by the way, I read the book, and I know how it ends. Jesus wins. I thought that was very powerful, and it kind of gave me the, <clears throat> kind of gave me the, really convicted me that this is what the Holy Spirit wanted me to talk about. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for allowing us to be in church today. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for the beautiful kids that were up here. And uh, we just pray that um, we could be more like Jesus. And we just ask that you'd bless our time together. Um, we pray that we'd be attentive and whatever message you have for each of us that we would gain it and apply it to our lives and I pray that uh, it would be your words not my words in Jesus name amen so I believe every Christian on the face of the earth greatly underestimates spiritual warfare perhaps even infinitely underestimates spiritual warfare I think all of us do I think the vast majority of of, Ameri of at least American Christians are day by day unaware that they're even in a spiritual war. And so I feel like my message today is meant to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Now, what does that mean? Um, I've heard it applied to art. I've heard it applied to uh, theology, uh, certainly belief systems and religious, different religious systems. But I guess the best I could come up with how I'm going to apply it to what I'm going to stay today or say today is we can find a resolution through searching and inquiry, critical thinking and truth, whether we are comfortable, disturbed, or even complacent. One of the most recognized heroes of the Revolutionary War was Paul Revere, and he is known for the Midnight Ride on April 18, 1775. We all know the story, but he was awoken from sleep in the middle of the night, was told that the redcoats are on the move, found out that they were coming by sea. He went and escaped through British roadblocks and strongholds, and then rode out to Lexington on horseback to warn everyone that was asleep that the redcoats were coming. The powerful British were coming. And you picture in your mind the militia, militia being roused from their beds, getting their weapons and going out to protect their possessions and getting ready to fight for their lives. And so I'm hopeful this message today is going to do some of that for us. I pray that this message will keep, will kind of interrupt our complacency and maybe even make us a little less at ease and uncomfortable that we would not be complacent, that we would be roused to be vigorous, attentive, and recognize how the Bible warns of spiritual warfare and how we fight against sin and evil. As the book of Amos says, woe to you are who are complacent in Zion. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is the story of Elisha with his servant and the Aramean troops that were surrounding the city. In the story, we all know it, how Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes. There are more for us than are for them. And so the servant was enabled to see in the spiritual realm the chariots of fire and the angelic army that was surrounding to defend and protect Elijah. Elisha, excuse me. Well, I have maybe a bit of an opposite mission today. I want us to have our eyes open to see there are spiritual forces of evil that are arrayed against each one of us without neglecting the fact that there's an angelic army 
and the sovereign power of God greater than anything we will face. But we do have to be aware of the rulers and the authorities and the powers of this present darkness. And we are only going to understand the battles we will face by faith. We are only going to be aware of the danger around us by faith in the word of God. So we're going to the book of Ephesians that has a whole section on spiritual warfare. And my desire is that we would be aroused and aware that our eyes and minds would be enlightened so that we can see spiritual danger and then take the precautions the Lord wants us to take. So the armor of God, we're going to read, I'm going to read the first couple of verses. Um, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So what are these verses really saying? It describes the spiritual battle that exists in the lives of believers. It does so perhaps better than any other words in Scripture. First, Paul affirms that our battle is indeed spiritual, not physical. The enemies we face ultimately are not people or objects. The devil may use these as part of his attack, but our true opponent is not other people. It is sin. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. I feel like many of us as Christians believe in the Most High God, creator of the ends of the earth and also in his own son jesus christ who sits at the right hand of god and our prayers go up to god and we have that sense of the loftiness and the grandeur and the greatness of god but then we see the physical world around us that operates by scientific laws and we're somewhat familiar with that and we operate in that realm and we're, we, we've increased in the last 200 years of our scientific awareness of the principles by which this physical world is governed. We're more and more aware of all of that. But we've excluded the middle realm of good versus evil and angels and demons. As verse 12 says, our struggles are against powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We choose to ignore or not to think about the evil, selfish, and sinful things that we are really up against. We act like it doesn't even matter. We are still in control. We're not aware of the kind of danger that we're, all, we're in all the time from the devil, from evil influences and temptations. Why do we sometimes push our choices and decisions as far to the edge as possible, thinking we can control ourselves and not go far enough into things that are not good for us? Why do we mess around with things that we know could be bad for us? Why do we crave things that are not good for us? 
it seems like this scripture we just read is a major wake-up call that we should be aware of what kind of enemies are opposing each of us every step of the way. We're not aware of Satan's moment-by-moment -moment activity and underestimate the lengths he will go to have us to choose anything over God. You may never think that if you're sick, it might be a satanic attack. You're not aware that if something breaks down, something happens, you just think materially, what will it take to get it fixed? But you wouldn't be aware of the fact that it might be Satan throwing something else at you to pull you further away from God, to gradually or even suddenly break you down. Or that when you're in a conflict, like couples or married folks occasionally get into these really serious discussions with one another, and in the course of one of these discussions, something pops in your head that if you said it, you'd spend months living it down and probably seriously regret it. And perhaps some of us have actually said it. So we say that thing, and then how do you explain or how do you unexplain it? Like smooth it over or put the toothpaste back in the tube. And then what's so amazing, it's like, I didn't re even really mean it or feel that way. What I just said was not true. Where did that come from? I would never want to say that to someone I really care about. Where did I know where it came from? 2 Timothy 26 says that, the devil can take us captive to do his will. And so that we actually, even as Christians, many times unknowingly, sometimes fall into the work of the devil. In order to be able to guard against this, we have to be more aware of the spiritual war happening around us. There's a popular three-part movie series called The Hobbit. Probably some of you have seen it, the whole Lord of the Rings type thing. I don't know how in the world they got three movies out of a 250-page book, but throw enough money at it, and they sure will. But at any rate, in the first movie, this hobbit named Bilbo Baggins finds this magic ring, this powerful ring that enables him to turn invisible. And he finds his previous owner is a wicked, vile creature named Gollum who just lives for lust of this ring. Loves it, but he lost it. He's looking for it, and Bilbo has found it. He doesn't know its power, but somehow he comes to put it on, and bam, he goes invisible. And this nasty creature, Gollum, is blocking his way out of his path in a cave system. And there's this very poignant scene in the movie where Bilbo, who is now invisible, has his sword laying right at the neck of Gollum, ready to kill him. But Bilbo has a good heart. He's got a merciful heart, and he doesn't want to kill him, and so he doesn't kill him. He pulls his sword back and jumps over him and escapes. So the reason I shared that story is turn all that around. Imagine the most vile, wicked creature you can imagine, worse than any human tyrant that's ever lived, worse than Hitler, worse than Stalin, worse than all of them, with Satan's sort of spiritual lies laying at your spiritual neck and zero mercy in his heart. That's the picture that I have of spiritual warfare. And the word of God has come to be a light shining in a dark place to show us the truth. So that we're aware of the kind of enemy that we are up against and that we will have to choose to fight. And so look at the text again in verse 10 through 13. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God that so you can take your stand against the devil. Devil's schemes for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, or we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything to stand, 
Stand firm then. So my goal is not to scare anyone or overly focus on Satan or even on sin. But according to the Bible, spiritual warfare is real. There's a real war going on, a spiritual war. We have a struggle. We wrestle. Look at verse 12. Our struggle, the NIV says, or the New International Version says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. A more realistic or literalistic translation is we wrestle. We have an ongoing wrestling. There's this day of evil that's on us, and so we have this struggle, this fight. So if you're a Christian, you are at war. War is upon you, and you need to know it. You need to be aware. You have a violent, a vigorous enemy that's against you. And so we wrestle. In the King James Version, it says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So, you're, so you picture a vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat, two soldiers with knives, and they're rolling on the ground, and they're grabbing at each other's clothes, and sweat coming down their faces. It's war, and they intend to kill each other. There can be no truce, no peace between the two. One or both of them will end that struggle dead. And that's the picture that we have in the Scripture. The Word of God alone has the power to teach us the reality of this spiritual warfare. You can't find it in a laboratory. You're not going to be able to come up with an experiment that will prove that it exists. It's the Word of God that tells us what's happening to us. What's going on? We're told in 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. So there's a war that we have to participate in and we have to fight against. So this warfare is spiritual. It's a spiritual war. It's not physical. It's being fought in the spiritual realm. And then Paul talks about how our struggle is, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Very, very important. We have spiritual enemies. Now, Paul makes an amazing assertion in the negative context. Our primary struggle is not against flesh and blood. That is not to say, as human beings, um, we don't have enemies. So Paul is not... Paul is certainly not denying the reality of human opposition to the kingdom of God. He's not saying you will never have a human enemy. I would imagine none of us will have as many human enemies as Apostle Paul did. I mean, committed, dedicated, murderous enemies. Paul had been on their side, one of them, and when he turned and became a servant of Jesus, they became his mortal enemies. Paul struggled mightily against the Jewish leaders of his nation who didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And they felt motivated to do everything they could to shut down the followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Even in Greece, they're going from town to town to persecute him and arrest him and stir up riots against him. The Jewish leaders would have killed Paul on the spot if they could. In the end, or and even the Romans to some degree were Paul's enemies. In the end, Caesar executed him, cut off his head. Many times, Paul was thrown in prison, beaten and threatened. So Paul knew very well that he had a vigorous human flesh and blood enemies. But he also knew that there is no enemy, no human enemy, so depraved, so wicked, so violent, they are beyond the sovereign grace of God to save. Even the bitterest enemy breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples can be converted in an instant like Paul was. He knew that. So does anyone here ever feel like nothing but struggles, disappointments, hurt, pain, anger, weariness, disappointment, fear, tired of dealing with so much bad? We're talking about pressure from all sides and not good pressure. Pressure, 
pushing on every square inch of our bodies all the time. We experience it so much and so often, we become used to it. It's all we've ever known. It's just the world we live in. It's like, does the fish know it's wet? Do we know that we're surrounded by a dark world? Does a lost person know they're really in darkness? I think if the Lord wills to take away all demonic influence from us for 24 hours, in which the devil could have literally no approach to us at all, not physically, not mentally, not in our feelings, not in our thoughts, none. I wonder if that day might be like the closest thing to heaven on earth that we've ever felt in our life because that pressure would be removed and you could be almost giddy with joy and peace as a Christian I mean just so confident so happy so elated everything's fine it's going to be okay friends we can look forward to an eternity of days like that in heaven amen I'm just really looking forward to that but all I'm saying is that's not happened yet and we have this pressure constant pressure Satan's called the power of the air the ruler of the kingdom of the air and so he's pressing on us all the time so our spiritual enemy is relentless he never stops look back at verse 11 put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes so this dude makes schemes. That's what the verse says in 11. He has schemes. And they're customized for each one of us. And it's really terrifying. But here's the truth. Just as you have a personal savior, you also have a personal enemy. You have, if you're a Christian, you have a savior. His name is Jesus Christ. But 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. So each one of us has an enemy, the devil. And yes, that's terrifying. What it means is, I think, that the devil and his demons study us and know our weaknesses and come after us all the time in our weakest areas all the time it's relentless now on to some good news Jesus Christ fought the devil every day of his life all of his life I believe Revelation 12 makes it plain that that ancient serpent the dragon Satan was ready to devour the male child the moment he was born King Herod sent soldiers to Bethlehem and its surrounding vicinity to kill all the boy babies that were two years old and under. That was a direct demonic plan, a scheme, a satanic attack seeking to kill Jesus. But the Lord had sent an, an angel to warn Joseph in a dream. To me, that proves angels can influence us and speak into our brains. And the angel spoke and warned him, get up. Flee, go to Egypt, because Herod is going to search for the child to try to kill him. And so Joseph took the warning from the angel that was insinuated in his mind, and he ran and he got Jesus out of there. And then when Jesus began his public ministry, after his baptism, right at the start of his ministry, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Forty days and forty nights. We're going to talk more about that in another sermon, God willing. Um, but we know through Scripture that the Holy Spirit led him, and the devil tempted him. Satan fought Jesus every step of his way, and Jesus opposed and advanced his kingdom by means of showing love, healing, and driving out demons. It was a battle of light versus darkness. Strangely, at the end of Jesus' life, at the Last Supper, Satan entered into Judas to go and betray Jesus to his death. So honestly, Satan didn't know 
really what to do with Jesus. He used everything he could, even one of his disciples, his friend, someone close to him, someone he cared deeply for, spent time with him. Satan is tempting him like, yes to the cross, no to the cross. Which is it? But ultimately, Satan was there fighting Jesus every step of the way. And at the cross, we're told in Hebrews chapter 2, and this is so vital for all of us, Jesus, by his death, destroyed him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and freed those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus set the prisoner free. He crushed Satan at the cross. So Satan is a defeated foe. But for now, he's still alive. He's still roaming the earth, and he's still dangerous. So stay with me, but like one of the things Satan does is he presents the bait and hides the hook, right? So I think about David and Bathsheba. And so David's out there on his roof looking, and he sees the bait. But he doesn't see what's going to happen, what his life is going to be like afterwards. Satan hides the hook. He's able to do that. He's very skillful at doing that. He's able to paint sin with virtue's colors so that sin looks actually virtuous and morality looks boring and dull. He's doing that in our culture today. Satan actually minimizes sin. He makes very little of it, making it appear minor and insignificant. He can twist our view of God, making us forget before we've committed the sin, that our God is a consuming fire. And then making us forget after we've committed sin that our God is the father of the prodigal son and welcomes penitent sinners back in the name of Jesus. He twists our perceptions of God. He's able to do that. He's able to persuade us that repentance will be easy later on, that the sin isn't that costly, it's not that big of a deal. And you can always repent later, forgetting the hardness of heart that sin produces. Satan makes it easy for us to venture into tempting situations. I can handle that. We do get into tempting, tempting situations. Satan shows what we think of as happy sinners or the prosperity of the wicked. So that we forget the darker side or the future of what's going to happen. Satan persuades sinners that there are a lot worse sinners than they are. And he works to discourage us from things that are good for us. Things like worship, prayer, Bible study, but also patience, temperance, self-control, discipline. He presents to us a twisted view of the difficulties, afflictions, unpopularity and troubles of serving Christ how hard it's going to be he makes us bored and weary of godly duties like getting up really getting up like getting excited about some quiet time praying reading our Bibles listening to sermons helping others he persuades us that holy duties will not make us better they're going to actually be ineffective in fighting sin and getting us to heaven. There's some truth to that. He seeks to manipulate God to use God's holiness and God's law against God's people. And he causes sinning Christians to despair of mercy and grace as though God can ne will never take them back. He does all of this and he orchestrates pressure pain struggles and persecution he is the most selfish wicked being there is but then he gets all righteous and accuses us of sin how can that be the devil is the greatest spiritual hypocrite there has ever been or will be but the devil has limitations he's on a chain right he's limited He's restrained. As powerful as he is, he is infinitely below God. Satan continues to exist only because God allows him to continue to exist. At any point, 
God could pull the plug on Satan's very existence. Now you may ask, why doesn't he do it? Because Satan is actually serving God's purpose in this world. God wants us to learn how to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He wants you to get stronger. He wants you to use your faith. He wants you to be strong. And so Satan is the foil against which you will be courageous and strong and bold. Satan wishes to harm us, destroy our hope, devour us. But in Job 1 and 2, Satan has to ask permission to get at Job. He complains about the hedge God puts around Job and all of his possessions. It says in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But with temptation, he will make a way of escape so you can stand up under it. I thought a lot about that. Now, I didn't say anything about, like, man, if I'm tempted, then zoop, he's just going to take me and take me away and put me somewhere else. No, I have to want to escape and leave that, recognize that for what it is. I have to want that. But God will supply a way. Praise God, that's Satan's leash. First, what does it mean to be strong in the Lord? What it means is you cannot, you must not try to fight this war on your own. When the devil comes, you've got to run to Jesus, get close to Christ. See, all of your fighting is with him and close to Jesus and empowered by him. Not a way like, look, Jesus, look what I can do. I got this. Apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. We must draw close to Jesus. Well, who is he? He is the omnipotent God of the universe. He's the God of Isaiah 40, who sits enthroned above the nations, and all the people are like grasshoppers, or like dust on the scales. They are like a drop from the bucket. That's the omnipotence of God, infinitely compowered, infinitely powerful compared to Satan. Be strong in his mighty power and his omnipotence. Do you believe nothing is impossible for Jesus? Nothing's particularly difficult, much less impossible. He created all this. Draw close to him, the undefeated one. He defeated all of Satan's attacks, lies, and temptations. He created you, me, and every living thing. Get close to him. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Find out how powerful he can and will be through you find out think of who you are in Jesus how righteous you are in him with his perfectness and his power in his glory how secure and strong you are in the gospel in God's word in his promises how much God loves you and at peace God is with you that's the strength of the Lord there's nothing Satan can do so I love Isaiah 40, 28. It says, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not get tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Think about that. Don't you get tired when tempted? I do. I mean, you're resisting, resisting, and it just doesn't seem to let up. And it gets weary to fight for holiness. Be strong in the Lord. He gives us strength and increases the power of the weak. So I'm going to ask the praise team to come up, and I want to recap a couple of things. As human beings, as Christians, we are at war. It is serious. You are at war. Wake up. Fight. Stop underestimating the amount of damage this war is causing you. How much trouble it's causing you you and your relationships how much trouble it's causing you in your parenting how much trouble it's causing you at work or at school stop underestimating be cautious and aware of what satan's doing when you fall into sin ask the lord to show you what satan did to get you so you don't do it again 
and evaluate your present life. How do you see Satan attacking you? Where does he get you? What's going on? What temptations have been a recurring theme in your life? How is Satan coming at you day after day? What temptations are conquering you? What habits do you have to change so you stop yielding to those temptations? It might have to do with places you need to stop going. A group of friends you need to let go. Your smartphone, the internet, your iPad, your chat life, or maybe something else. What material thing or things are you living for? What hidden anger or unforgiveness is Satan stirring up in you so that you're hostile towards someone you should love? How is Satan duping you and drawing you away from God? In closing, I'm going to leave with four ways we can protect our minds in spiritual warfare. Identify the enemy, which is Satan, and recognize he is desperate. His goal is to do anything he can to draw us away from God. Number two, understand the battle will be ongoing until Jesus returns, and the enemy will use personal attacks. Know that we have protection from God with spiritual armor. Remember we have a powerful weapon, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for the time we've had to worship today, to share and study your Word. Father, I pray that you would strengthen each of us for our battles. Help us to be more aware than we've been of what the devil does and how he gets us. Help us, O oh Lord, to fight, and not just fight, but to win, to be victorious in Christ, to stand firm for you in times of testing and temptation. Father, help us to do all this for your glory and for the spread of your gospel here at Taft, in our community, and in every person we come in contact with. We love you and thank you for all your goodness, your grace, and mercy. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.